For those here this morning in the sanctuary, or maybe you're listening online or through a radio station, or maybe you're watching the live stream, YouTube, Facebook, I want to welcome all of you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass, where it is our desire to go deeper in the word, deeper in prayer, where we study God's word line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Please turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 7. On Wednesday, we ended uh, verse 7 of Acts 7, so we're going to pick it up in verse 8. Acts Chapter 7, verse 8. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. I love that verse. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of a Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Verse 11, now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Verse 14, then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. Verse 15, so Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Amar, the father of Shechem. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. And as it's been said, this is your church. Lord, we just pray that by your spirit, you speak to us. We all need to hear from you, Lord. We need to hear your voice. We need to feel your touch. By your Holy Spirit, just minister to us in the name of your Son, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we pick up this morning's passage as Stephen Having been arrested, he stands before the council, the Jewish council, which is the Sanhedrin, the 71-member Supreme Court of Israel, which this court, they will decide his fate. He's accused of speaking blasphemy against Moses, the Mosaic law and the temple, which if proven guilty could be fatal to his health. In Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, it says, And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. The accusations against Stephen, they are serious. Accused of blasphemy. Against God because he challenged the permanence of the temple. Against Moses because he challenged the permanence of the Mosaic law. To the Jews, these things, they were sacred. The temple where God resided. And sacrifice to God alone could be offered. And the law, the law which could never be changed. Stephen, in preaching Jesus to the people and the apologists who were opposing him. Stephen said that the temple had held no value anymore. It was obsolete, outdated. And the atonement for one's sins was now through Jesus. The only sacrifice needed, the only sacrifice needed was for one to sacrifice their heart, their life. To Jesus. Jesus was, he is, the final sacrificial Passover lamb for the sin of the whole world. In John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, therefore purge out the old leaven, then you may be a new lump, 
since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Stephen, he was saying to the Sanhedrin, the religious rulers who were trying him, he was saying that it was time for a change. Time to purge the old leaven, the old covenant, the old faith, Judaism, and to embrace the new revelation, the new covenant, the new faith, Christianity. Christianity, the belief that salvation now rests in the name of Jesus. And regarding the law, though Stephen's accusers thought that he was bashing the Mosaic law, he in fact was saying that the law, the law it was a stepping stone to Jesus. And then Jesus was the fulfillment of that law. Jesus himself stated in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one twiddle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Stephen, standing before this council, he is not looking for an acquittal of the charges against him. He understands who he is in front of. These were the same men who falsely tried, condemned, and crucified his Lord, his Master, his Savior. He knows the true character, determination of his foes. He knows that he is a marked man. But the many stands before they are incorrect in their logic, and he wants to set them straight. His concern is to unravel the false from the true in the charges laid against him. And he wants to show to them the true nature and love of Christianity. See, most people have Christianity backwards. Through the agenda of the enemy, Christianity is viewed as hateful, harsh. Harsh as in non-accepting, unloving. Harsh as in if you don't believe in Jesus as a son of God, Jesus, he's going to send you to hell. Jesus is viewed as the heavenly enforcer who casts you into eternal damnation. That is wrong. That is false. That is backwards. Jesus doesn't send you to hell. Your iniquities, your sin, your black heart does. Because of sin, we are all, all of us are unworthy to stand in front of a just and holy God. Our sins make us unholy and unrighteous before God to even have fellowship, communion with God. I want you to imagine a courtroom setting just as Stephen is here in Acts chapter 7, but this courtroom is a heavenly courtroom. And you are there. You are standing before God and the accuser, Satan, as the prosecutor against you. He is present. And he has laid out a rock-solid case against you to God. (laughs) Your sin made it so simple. Satan standing before God with a sly smile on his face, confident in his case, knowing that judgment soon is coming. Justice will conquer, and you, you will be condemned. Guilty as charged, sentenced into the depths of hell, darkness, separation from God. And just before the verdict is read, Jesus enters as your defense lawyer, your advocate. Scripture tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. 
And Jesus says to all present with the whole angelic realm watching that because of your belief, your belief in his name, the dead is gone. The dead is gone. That because Jesus hung in the gap for you on the cross, the penalty, the ransom, it's paid. It's paid. Jesus, he isn't the villain, the heel, the enforcer who throws you into hell. You are. Jesus, he is the hero. He is the liberator, the rescuer who saves you from hell. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Nor is there a salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Because of the times that we live in, I have to keep repeating this. There is only one way to see the kingdom of heaven. And that is through belief in the name of Jesus that because of his blood that he died on the cross for you, for me, for all of our sins. That if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, heaven awaits. There is no other name. There is only one way to heaven and that is through Jesus. No matter what the world tells you, no matter what other religions tell you, no matter what other false preachers, teachers, pastors tell you there is only one way. If they say that there are a multitude of ways that God is so big that he'll understand, they're not teaching from here because this Bible does not say this. There is only one way and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus are we saved. Stephen's defense against the charges that are laid out against him. His defense is to take the offense, to be, to take the offensive against these charges. And in Acts chapter 7, it is the record of Stephen's reply to the Sanhedrin. It is his testimony And it is the most detailed and concise history of Israel and its relationship to God in Scripture and his indictment of Israel, Israel's unwillingness to hear God's voice and to change. Stephen, he starts his eloquent discourse with Abraham. For with Abraham, the life of faith and history of the Jews began. In verses 1 through 7 of this chapter, Stephen proclaims that the revelation of God to Abraham was independent of Moses or the temple. That God is neither restricted to a special person, Moses, or a special place, the temple. God reveals himself when and where he wishes, as he did to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia. And the temple, the temple wasn't holy because that's where the ark was. It wasn't holy because of all of the gold that was all over the temple, not because of the, the precious metals. It was holy because that's where God chose to inhabit. Abraham, through faith, he answered God's call. Though he had no idea where God was leading him, And he had no tangible possessions or wealth in that land. He didn't know where he was going. All he had was a promise, a promise from God. A promise of a promised land for him and his descendants. But not the place of the promise from God. See, his faith was exercised along purely Spiritual lines. Faith in an unseen future. God wanted Abraham's faith not to be in the bounty of the promised land, but to be in God alone. To be in God alone. And that is no different today. God calls us. He calls us to walk by faith. Not by sight. To trust 
in him, even though we don't know what tomorrow brings, to trust and hope in Jesus. It always comes down to faith, trust, and hope. Faith, trust, and hope. The trinity of belief. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is believing even when we do not see the solution. Stephen, he continues his history lesson to the rulers, stating that even Abraham's descendants would for 400 years not even be in the promised land, but instead they would be slaves in a foreign land. Speaking of the captivity in Egypt, but that God would lead his people out and that Abraham's descendants would serve God in the promised land. Faith of things hoped for, evidence of things unseen. Stephen, in front of the Sanhedrin, charged with blasphemy, which carry a death sentence. He is, through history, proving that what he said against the temple, against the law, was not blasphemy unto God. See, the rulers, they had their facts wrong. They had their facts wrong. The founding of the Hebrew nation occurred in Mesopotamia, not in Jerusalem, God's liberation of the people occurred in Egypt, not in Jerusalem. The law was given in the desert, not in Jerusalem, not in the temple. God doesn't live only in a temple or any other building, but wherever he so chooses. And now through his spirit, his Holy Spirit, he lives in all of us, all of those who believe in his son, Jesus. The rulers believed that the world revolved around Israel and that Israel revolved around Jerusalem and that Jerusalem revolved around the temple. The rulers, they had no idea, no idea that in less than 70 years, the temple would be completely destroyed, completely not one rock upon another. Even today, there is still no temple in Jerusalem, no animal sacrifices for atonement. I am so thankful that as a believer in Jesus the Christ, I have been sanctified and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. I don't need to sacrifice an animal. Amen. Verse 8. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. So Stephen, continuing in his defense or offense against the charges, he brings up the covenant of circumcision. Why? One sign that God did give to Abraham was a physical sign of those who were to be his. An outward cutting away of the flesh to distinguish those set apart to God. Circumcision. The rulers, these religious leaders, they took pride in their physical heritage and they boasted of their circumcision. See, they thought just because they were Jewish and they were circumcised that Heaven awaited them. John the Baptist warned them of this, of their faulty thinking in Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. He said, do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. See, God took the cutting edge of the knife and brought it to bear on all that spoke of the flesh. Abraham was taught physically and symbolically to bear on his body the marks of God. True children of Abraham are those who follow Abraham's example of believing in God. 
Physical circumcision doesn't make one a child of God. Faith in Jesus does. Believers in Jesus can truly say that they, that we, are children of Father Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. For all of us who believe in the name of Jesus, we're heirs. Heirs to what? To a heavenly kingdom. We are royalty. doesn't matter where we came from. When we believe in Jesus, our past is gone. All that matters is the future. Jesus, because of what he did, accomplished on the cross, all of our sins are thrown away. And it doesn't matter what side of the tracks we were raised on. It doesn't matter what our job, anything. We all become heirs. A promise from God. God has always wanted more from his people than just external conformity to a set of rules. See, God, he wants us to possess a heart to love him, to know him, and to follow him, to follow him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. That's why God is not concerned with circumcision of the flesh. God's priority is a spiritual circumcision of our hearts. As believers, we are to circumcise our hearts, to cut away that which keeps us from God, that which keeps us out of fellowship, out of communion with God. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Obviously, as your shepherd, I want you to be happy with me. I care what you think. But when it really matters, when the rubber hits the road, what matters to me is what God thinks. This is God's church. That's why we as leadership, we value prayer so much because we need the wisdom of God because the wisdom of man, it's no good. A changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Though physically the rulers might have been circumcised, which they were circumcised, Their hearts were far from God. Their hearts were far from God. Where is your heart this morning? Are you far from God? Verse 9. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. See, even he now changes his angle of attack to show that right from the start, The Jewish people had resisted God's plan for them. Their unbelief began with the treatment of Joseph. Joseph, one of the great types of Christ in the Old Testament. As the Sanhedrin had rejected Jesus, so the patriarchs rejected Joseph. And for the same reason, envy, envy. Pontius Pilate well knew that it was for envy that the Jewish leaders delivered Jesus to him. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 18, it says, for he knew that for envy they delivered him. Stephen 
was letting those rulers who was in front of him, who stood to judge him, he was letting them know that they were running true to type. The sons of Jacob united to get rid of Joseph. The children of Israel united to get rid of Jesus. The patriarchs, they resented Joseph because of his goodness. The rulers, they rejected and envied Jesus because of his. Joseph was rejected by his brethren. He was sold for the price of a slave. That's what Judas Iscariot was paid to give up Jesus. Joseph, he was falsely accused. He was made to suffer for sins, not his own. He was cast out and put in the place of death, the bowels of a prison. But he took possession of the keys of that prison and he ruled there as he ruled everywhere. That death could not hold him and he came out of that prison in triumph to be exalted in Egypt. The verse says he ruled not only over all the land, but also Pharaoh's own house. The Pharaoh, he was in charge of his house. Stephen, he had no need to make the obvious applications of that historical story to Jesus the Christ, the members of the Sanhedrin, they knew where Stephen was leading them. Just as the prison could not hold Joseph, the grave could not hold Jesus. The rulers knew full well about the resurrection of Jesus. Though they denied it, they knew it was true. Verse 11. Now famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. So Stephen is continuing the history lesson of Israel. All that happened, it worked together for the good, as Joseph would later tell his brothers. Though he was sold as a slave, God took care of him. And what was meant for evil, God used for good. God was able to take the rejection of Joseph and make him an instrument of salvation, just like God did through Jesus at Calvary. Calvary, the cross. The cross represents the greatest tragedy in man's dealings with God, the final expression of sin. At the same time, the cross, it represents the greatest triumph in God's dealing with man. For God took all of our sins, and in Christ, he nailed those sins to a tree. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Men meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It is only with the full light of the New Testament shining upon the Old Testament pages that we can appreciate really the cleverness of Stephen's speech. For what happened in Joseph's day will be repeated on a much grander scale in the last days to drive the Jews back to Jesus. Verse 13. And the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. Again, Stephen, he does not dwell on all of the details that his listeners knew by heart. Remember, this is the Sanhedrin, the most educated, influential men in all of Israel as scholars. They knew Israel's history better really than all. But Stephen is paralleling Joseph with Jesus. Joseph at the right hand of the Pharaoh. He begins to work sovereignly to bring repentance and restoration to and of his family. 
Joseph's family. Jesus, through his sacrifice on the cross, he brings repentance and restoration to all, to all of us who believe in the name of Jesus. When the reconciliation was complete, Joseph, as the Bible tells us, brings his family to live with him. In verse 14, in John chapter 14, verses two and three, tells us that Jesus, Jesus, he will do the same with us. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Soon and very soon, we will be with Jesus. Come quickly. Verse 15. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Amor, the father of Shechem. Neither Joseph nor Jacob lost sight of one fact. All of God's promises to his Old Testament people were to be fulfilled. In Canaan, Jacob and all the forefathers were all to be carried and buried back in the promised land, in Abraham's tomb, the only land that he, Abraham, actually purchased and possessed in the promised land. All other land, possessions, inheritance, it was received by faith. It was received by faith. 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 In a moment, we are going to partake of communion. If I could please have the team come forward to get ready for that. Communion is where we recognize this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. To recognize that he died for our sins. Communion is only for those who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and for those who are living a repentant life. So usually a church will discourage anyone who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, or those that are caught up in sin, they will discourage them from partaking of communion. I'm going to flip that around. I want to encourage you, all of you, for those who do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe that you are currently in sin. It's got you in bondage. I want to encourage you that as the men, as they start to hand out the elements, that you come forward for prayer. We're going to have some pastors and their wives up here for prayer. Communion is a time of reflection. And if needed, to come forward for prayer, for repentance, redemption, salvation. Scripture also tells us to check our hearts. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We are to examine our hearts. For us to ignore this verse is to call forth the discipline of God. Here at Calvary Chapel, Grants Pass, we have two cups. The bread is on the bottom, the juice on top. In a few moments, we're going to have a song playing. Please hold on to the elements, and then after this song, I'll speak, and then we will partake together. Maestro. If you are not in the right place with God, we have pastors up here. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Stephen, as he was speaking to the Sanhedrin, he knew what he was saying. He knew it was a death sentence. All the apostles, the disciples, all of them, died horrific deaths. All they had to do was just say, I don't believe in Jesus. And they would have been saved. They all counted it worthy to die. 
Now, the disciple John did die a natural death, but they tried to boil him in oil. Church is meeting with God. Communion is recognizing what Jesus did for us and who he is to us. I love the words of that song. Run to the Father, fall into grace. In all honesty, all of us are prodigal sons and daughters. We are all unworthy. But God in his love for us, he gave us a way. to take back that relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden, the fall of man. God gave us his son to die for us. And Jesus left his throne in heaven to come down here to live a humble life. A hard life. And then to suffer and die for us. This is in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Matthew. Chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for, my, for many for the forgiveness of sins. For the forgiveness of sins, the sins of the whole world. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. And we just give thanks to you. And to your son that while we were still sinners, you loved us. Jesus, you loved us unto death. You took the shame. You took the wrath, the punishment that was due to us. You paid the ransom, the propitiation for us. You bore it on your shoulders. You alone. You died so that we may live. We hear in this building, listening, watching. We thank you for your sacrifice to us. It is my prayer that we never forget what you did for us, that every single day we proclaim your name. We proclaim your glory. We proclaim the gospel, the good news of you, and that we remember. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please partake. Please, if you need to do business with God, do not leave until you come up and talk to one of the pastors, get prayer. If you're listening online or watching and you need to talk to somebody, find a Christian. If you don't know one, go online and call the number here for Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. We'll call you back. God is so good. God loves us so much that he sent his son to die. I pray that God blesses all of you this afternoon and that you are kept steadfast in his love. 
God bless.